Okay, so um, I'll make a start. Um, it's Friday and all. I'm sure we're all keen to get to, to do other things. So um, in my last presentation, I talked about the, the two really important types of information we gather during habitat mapping surveys. We've got the point data, which is the, the ground truthing data typically, or it, it can be transex, it can be line data, or it can be areas, but typically it's point data. And then we've got the remote sensing data, which uh, is um, a data surface. And of course, what we want to do is extrapolate the point data to the surface, to the data surface. So as I said, two data sources. And this slide really captures what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the different modeling approaches we use to produce habitat maps that combine this information and produce the maps. I'm really going to spend most of my time focusing on this central technique here, which we call a, a supervised approach. It's by far the most effective, and it combines the point data, the in-situ data, and the remotely sensed data. And we call it a supervised technique because what we're doing is, by providing ground truthing, we're telling the model what we want it to find in the data surfaces by the remotely sensed data. If the ground truthing is for coral and seagrass and sponges, you are telling that model, you're supervising that model to find those similar areas in the remotely sensed data. But there are other options and I'm quickly going to cover those so that um, you have a complete understanding of the different avenues you can take to produce a habitat map. So if in the unlikely situation, you only have ground truthing data, maybe point, da well, point data, then you're pretty much limited to um, either producing what are called Fecian polygons or doing some sort of interpolation if your ground truthing is a continuous variable. I'll come back onto this in a moment. The alternative is if you've only got remotely sensed data and no ground truthing. If that's the case, and you can't get any kind of training data, then you do what's called an unsupervised classification. This is basically a clustering technique. You're asking a statistical um, method to find natural groupings of values within these data surfaces. It's not supervised. It'll find what it thinks is important, not what you necessarily want to map. Okay, so let's just spend a little bit more time on these before we go on to the supervised technique. Thesian polygons are very, very basic, but they can turn point data, categorical point data, into a surface. The Thesian polygons tool is available in ArcGIS and QGIS. You could probably do it in R as well. Um, it's very available. And it's a very simple approach. All it does, it's putting a boundary equidistant between any point. Any points that have the same class, coral and coral, it'll merge them. And so it'll start to dissolve those sections into larger areas. Now, although quite basic, funny enough, I found myself using this approach only a couple of weeks ago when somebody gave me some point data and absolutely no ground truthing. Uh, no, sorry, remotely sensed data surfaces. And I needed to fill a gap in a, in a larger map. So actually, this is my only option. The alternative is if you have point data that's a continuous variable, say it's seagrass density or litter, um, <clears throat> any kind of continuous variable, then you've got the option of using all the standard interpolation approaches like natural neighbor, distance, um, inverse distance weighting, and creaking. 
I won't um, talk about this much. Um, so this is the, actually just to go back a couple of slides, uh, just when it comes to the uh, remotely sensed surfaces, we've got two choices. We can cluster or we can do a rule-based approach. Tim has very kindly introduced the benthic terrain modeler, which is a perfect example of a rule-based classification system. <clears throat> that dictionary that Tim referred to has rules in it. It'll say, find me a C mount that has a slope value between X and Y, or um, a continental shelf that is between depth values A and B and it'll delineate that based on a rule. So that's rule-based modeling. And it's very good for features that have a standardized description, like seamount, like continental shelf, like a canyon slope. And the same rule-based approach can be used for biological, for, for, for species distribution mapping. If you know that your seagrass will only grow between zero and 10 meters. It'll only grow in certain light conditions or in the, between a certain latitude. You can use these rules to also generate a rule-based classification and ultimately a map. So very simple approaches, but they're still useful and powerful. When you've got no ground truthing and just your remotely sensed data, the other option is you cluster it. This is where you're, it's an unsupervised approach and you're basically telling a clustering approach to find natural groupings of data. So a very good example of this is like the k-means that Tim referred to. It'll take points and it'll just look for natural groupings. Now, what you will need to do with k-means is tell it how many classes you want it to find. And then you will have to spend time at the end working out what those classes mean. It's not a supervised approach. It's not going to be what you tell it to be. And this sometimes can be a bit awkward because some of the clustering won't be informational classes. So for example, um, sun glint on a image might be turned into a cluster because the stats think it's very distinct and it is. Um, so yes, some of the classes aren't always what we call informational classes. So that was the rule-based approach and the clustering and the Thesian polygons and the interpolation are what you do if you haven't got both remote sensing and ground truth and data. But if you do have both, you have the added value and power of being able to do a supervised approach. These are by far the best approach. They're more powerful. You put the hard work in at the beginning by classifying your ground truthing, and then the model will use that classification, those labels, for the final classification. You don't have to interpret clusters at the end. They've often got various names, so sometimes they're called species distribution models, habitat suitability models, environmental niche models, they're all the same thing. Now they're particularly valuable because they are combining both types of data, point data, line data, and these data surfaces. And what's also good is some of these analyses will start to tell you what environmental variables are important for determining the distribution of your habitats on your map. So if output, will be predictive, you'll produce a map, but you'll also get inference information that will tell you what is driving the distribution of your seagrass locally. Is it light? Is it distance to shore? Is it nutrient concentration? If you've put those variables into your model. 
And also, I know I keep going on about this, but uh, it's very important that we always communicate our maps with some sort of assessment of their accuracy. Um, and of course, these models, they produce model performance statistics and they allow you to do extra validation. And that's really powerful for communi communicating the quality of your map to people like policymakers who will use your map um, for potentially quite fundamental marine management. Right, so a quick couple of limitations about this approach. Um, I've talked about this, the, the, the issue about suitable habitat and occupied habitat already. Um, so I'm gonna pass on that. I've talked about the element of trust. You know, we all grow up with, with atlases and we assume they are always correct. Habitat maps, less so. So you've gotta be careful about that. And there's lots of little things you can do whilst you're modeling that can artificially inflate your accuracy values. So I'm gonna talk through some of those as I go along so that you're aware of them and we don't oversell the quality of our maps. But what I will always suggest is you, it's quite easy sometimes to model habitats and get a map, but the quality is important. And there's no doubt about it, these modeling approaches are no replacement for having good quality data at the beginning, about having plenty of ground truthing points and good quality and appropriate remote sensing variables. So the whole process from top to bottom, um, I'll quickly cover this and then we'll examine each one in more detail so we know exactly what we're doing. Point number one, Okay, what's the purpose of your modeling? And I would always recommend you produce a conceptual diagram, a conceptual model of what you think is driving the distribution of your habitats. I'll talk about this in more detail in a moment. Next, it's all about the statistical formulation uh, um, and gathering data. So again, we need to get our, the response variable which of course is our ground truthing. We need to get our predictive variables, which are remote sensing, and we've got to get them together. We then need to pick a, a modeling method, and there's lots of different methods with different strengths and weaknesses, and we'll discuss those as well. And then there's a process of model selection, which is where you start to thin out all these predictive variables that aren't actually helping the model. The third step is to then train the model. That's where you sit down with your software and make your model. The fourth stage is to use that model to predict across the entire remotely sensed data set to produce your map. And then the fifth stage is, val is validation. So each one in more detail. Yes, okay. So the, the first thing I would do is a, is a conceptual model. What you want to know is if you're modeling, say, seagrass, you need to, in your back of your mind, have a basic understanding of what you think is driving the distribution of seagrass. Is it light? Is it nutrients? Is it some sort of human pressure? And you need to have a conceptual model that will really ground what you're doing in some sort of ecological reality. Uh, and it, I think it's very important, I'll talk about this again in a moment, that it's, re it's really important that you can justify why you are including particular predictive variables in your model. There's a tendency to add stuff because you've got it, which is bad practice. You know, I'll a bit more about that later. So conceptual model, and that's where you're thinking about the resolution you need, the accuracy you need for a particular purpose as well. The second consideration is whether you are doing this exercise for inference or for prediction. 
So inference is all about exploring the data and understanding why uh, things vary spatially. Why is my seagrass here and not here? Well, we can use inference to, it's, it's sort of the process for looking at the information and getting it to tell us, oh, it's not here because it's too deep or it's not here because nutrients are too high. And so there's modeling approaches that favor looking at inference rather than prediction. And prediction, of course, is the production of habitat maps. So there's some modeling approaches that do prediction very well, but if you wanted to actually understand the ecology of your habitats or your species, they're not very helpful because they're quite complex and they don't lend themselves to being analyzed too deeply. So, um, also, uh, ooh, gosh, back you go. Um, just in the top right uh, of this slide, you'll see that the, the workflow is contained there. And as we go through the workflow, that'll change. And that's just to give you an idea of where we are along that modeling workflow. So here, purpose and conceptual model. Next, the response variable. What do I mean by that? That is what we're basically modeling. And it's typically the classes that we have encoded the ground truth thing with. Response variables can be all sorts of binary information, like a presence absence, coral, yes or no, seagrass, yes or no. It can be categories, so it could be coral, sand, seagrass, gravel, or they can be continuous variables. So we could potentially model seagrass density or fish biomass. So all three are perfectly acceptable response variables. Uh, what else would I like to say? Let's see now, the attribution for your response variable, yeah, definitely provides the classes for your habitat map. So if you don't include it in your ground truth thing, your model's not gonna find it. Sounds obvious, but it can catch some people out. Equally, you don't necessarily have to use species identity. You can be quite creative with some of these response variables. They could be things like traits, maybe like body size or condition or other things that you can derive from your ground truth thing. It doesn't have to be habitat or species. It can be trophic level. Um, so that's a current trend in marine habitat mapping to actually look at species traits rather than species identity or habitat identity. Another thing to highlight is when we have presence only data. So if I go to one of these online repositories of information, I can download all the presence observations for a deep, a deep cold water coral species. That is all presence data. What I haven't got is any absence data. I can tell the model where it is, but I can't tell a supervised model where it isn't. So for that, I need absence information. And there are ways of generating this. So if you are just downloading stuff and you've got presence, you could potentially use another species. It doesn't occur with the species of interest. So maybe you know, a cold water coral, it might be a particular sponge that you know doesn't grow anywhere near the coral. Or you can use perhaps random points if you're absolutely certain that you've got all the presence information you need. But if you've got presence and absence information, you've got access to more powerful modeling techniques. So just be aware of that. And also the response variable, um, the ground truthing data set you have is ultimately, if you choose to do validation, is split. It's typically like a 70-30 split between the information that's used to train the model and a subset of about 30% of your observations that are used to validate the end product. And they're kept completely separate from the modeling exercise because we want to maintain their independence. 
if you use them in the modeling, they're going to be, they're going to basically inflate your accuracy values, which you cannot do. So what else do we need to consider when it comes to the response variable, the ground truth in that we're putting into our model? And the really big elephant in the room is spatial order correlation. Sounds complicated, but actually it's quite basic. All it says is that two points that are very near each other are more likely to be the same. So this temperature maps a very good example. Two states that are next to each other have similar temperatures. An east coast and west coast state, totally different temperatures. It's obvious, but what this does is fundamentally break one of the assumptions one of the most important assumptions of many of these models, which is that your ground truthing, your training data is independent. Each observation is independent of each other, which if there is spatial order correlation within your data, this will not be the case. If you ignore this and model anyway, then you will get nice models, but they will have very inflated accuracy values. So it's something that we need to tackle before we can move on to actually modeling. <clears throat> so the common test for spatial order correlation is called Moran's eye. You can do it in R, you can do it in probably QGIS, you can do it in ArcMap. And if you find spatial order correlation is present, it's best to try and tackle it uh, before you do the modeling. Some models are a little bit insensitive to spatial order correlation, but the jury's out on how insensitive. I'll come back to that later. But your best bet is to do a bit of subsampling. So if you've got two points that are very near each other, you might have to consider thinning your data set to remove one of those points so that you haven't got two points right next to each other. Certain approaches you can use um, the latitude and longitude as predictive variables themselves. And you can include it as an, what's called an interaction term in like a mixed model. And that will then compensate because you're telling it the spatial relationship between your ground truth and points. And it is therefore able to then um, remove it really. Uh, so yes, it's a complicated process. I would recommend this reference here. Um, it's a good source of information about how to tackle spatial order correlation. Many maps are produced. It, it's, a, it's a problem with terrestrial and marine maps, any kind of spatial data, um, but it does need to be taken care of. <clears throat> so we've also got the predictive variables, of course. These are the remote sensing data sets. And as I said, Typically, the remote sensing data provides the majority of your predictive variables, but it, they can be the derived variables that Tim explained so well, the slope, rugosity, curvature, anything that you can derive from bathymetry is also a predictive variable. It could also be model outputs, hydrodynamics, or even interpolated point data. So if you have nutrient observations, you could interpolate those if they're point data and produce a surface that you can then use as a predictive variable within your models. But I would urge a little bit of caution here because what you need to do is you need to really be able to justify why you're adding all these predictive variables. Don't just add them because you have them uh, because what you end up doing is you'll have to thin them out later on anyway. And if you don't do that, you you can potentially overfit your models. That's a process where you, you produce such a, a complex model, it follows all the noise in your ground truthing data set, in your training data, and you get very um, poor models for transferring to other areas and extrapolating across a data surface. So you've got to be able to justify ecologically why you're including all these predictive variables. Often a lot of these things will be at different resolutions. So you might have some that's at 10 meter and some at five. 
and that there are plenty of up and down scaling options to get them to a similar resolution should you want to. And the, the next important consideration is you can collect all these predictive variables. You need to explain why you're using them ecologically, but also if they correlate with each other, you're going to have to thin them out as well. So only last week I was mapping seagrass around the UK and I used depth and I used um, available light at depth. And of course they correlate. The deeper you are, the less light there is. So I had co-correlated predictive variables and I had to make a difficult decision as to which one to include. Anyway, this is a process called model selection and um, this slide addresses it in a bit more detail. So model selection is about thinning out all these predictive variables that you've tried to stick in your model. As I said, if you have too many of them, you get an overfitted model, which is not good, especially if you want prediction. If you want inference, well, perhaps overfitting isn't too bad, but for prediction, it's not good. You get poor predictions in. So as I said, what can you do if you have too many predictive variables? Firstly, can you justify ecologically? Secondly, use a correlation matrix to remove anything that's correlated, depth and light availability of depth. They will correlate, one of them has to go. Or you could use a data reduction exercise like principal components analysis, which reduces what's called the dimensionality of the data. What it would do is make like artificial variables that merge correlated stuff. There's also options within models to do this model selection. Um, so they're called uh, in random forests, they're called shrinkage splines. Sorry, in uh, generalized additive models, are called shrinkage splines. And the final approach is to do to iterate your model, putting in one predictive variable, then taking it out. These are sometimes called pairwise selection processes, and you can use model performance statistics to tell you which model is better. So one that's very well known is called the Akeki information criterion. And what that does, it looks for good quality models, but are um, it'll penalize complicated models. So if you have more predictive variables, the AIC value inflates. But if you get a simpler model that has just as much predictive power, then you get better AIC value. So you can use any of these processes to remove redundant predictive variables. And it's a really important step if you want to produce habitat maps. Right, okay, now you're at the point of having to pick a model. Now there are a couple of choices. There are what are called, loosely called statistical models, which are kind of the old fashioned, uh, but well used and well understood um, packages like uh, generalized linear modeling, generalized additive modeling. They've got their roots in statistics and more importantly in inference. They're used for prediction and they're good for prediction. But there's this family statistical modeling and they're much better for inference than they are prediction. To a point, they're, they're getting very similar, I have to say, statistical and uh, machine learning approaches. Um, I'll pass on this because it looks scary, but basically it's saying that something like a GAM, that's a, a statistical based regression, it looks a bit like a normal regression that you've got a response variable, you have coefficients and you have uh, a null error um, function at the end. Um, so statistical regressions, the alternative is are, are the kind of new kids on the block, the trendy stuff, the machine learning modeling approaches. And so that includes things like uh, boosted regression trees and random forests. Now they can do, they're primarily built, I suppose, to be classifiers, but they can also do regression of like continuous variables. 
but really I think their strength lies in classification. And also they tend to be a little bit better for prediction than they are inference. And that's because these models can become very complicated. They can look at really interesting and quite vague interactions between predictive variables that are very hard to interpret. So they're good for quite complex data sets, um, but if you basically want to understand what's important and what's driving and explaining the variance within your training data, then um, they can be a bit complicated to understand. Um, perhaps I'll not go into too much detail about how random forests work, but basically there's two important design concepts to it really. Firstly, they use a process called bootstrapping. Um, so a bootstrap is if I had a hundred ground truthing observations or training data points, it'll take 80% of those, 80 of them, and run a model. Then it'll randomly reselect another 80 and run another model. And it keeps this random resampling of your ground truthing and your training data again and again and again. Now the value of that means that it's always got 20 observations it can use to validate each iteration of the model and therefore it can start to score the quality of each model. So this is basically called uh, bootstrapping. The information it doesn't use is called out-of-bag data uh, and everything else goes into the model. The other important thing about random forests is each tree that they, each model that, that it generates, it randomly selects the predictive variables and tries all the different combinations of all the different predictive variables. And it does it again and again, and randomly reselecting predictive variables. So that's basically the concept of random forests. So it can produce like 500 of these individual models, and then it merges them based on the quality of each model to produce an overall model. The only other thing to mention, it became trendy, I don't know, about 10 years ago, was to do this ensemble modeling. And that's where you might produce a random forest model and a GAM model and a boosted regression tree model. And you combine them together, you merge them to produce one model you merge the output into one output. And the idea is that strengths and weaknesses of the different modeling approaches tend to balance each other out and you get quite a kind of consistent, quite a good product at the end. Um, I mention it for completeness. I'm not a big fan of them because I don't know why when you can test and validate each model, you would necessarily choose to include poorer performing models, but they are used so I'm, mentioning them out of uh, completeness here. So as I said, uh, which modeling approach is the best? Well, each situation is different. It depends if you wanna make predictions, maybe consider machine learning approaches. If you want to understand what's driving variance within the data, that's inference, maybe the statistical approaches are better for you. Um, I think there's one important thing to mention about um, regression and machine learning, certainly for random forests, is that, that they can only make predictions within the data range of your training data. So if you've got depths of five to 15 meters covering your training data, a random forest will do a perfectly good job of doing some sort of regression within those points. But if you have a value of 17 meters in your predictive variables, then it doesn't know what to do. And it produces very poor results at that point. At which point you're much better using a statistical approach like a GAM or a generalized linear model to do that kind of process. Oops. Right, okay, so we picked a model. Let's just say it's gonna be random forest because random forests are good, they're fast and they're, they're powerful. So what are we going to do? We need, we need to sort of train these models now. We need to make this model. So there's plenty of choice of software out there to do it. Um, Tim's 
I'm not sure if you did mention, but there's the marine uh, geospatial ecology tools, the MGET tools. They've been around for a long time. It's a add-in for ArcMap, and it was very much my gateway drug to habitat mapping uh, and modeling, because basically there are packages in understandable GIS front ends. And so that got me started on R and, and other things. There's plenty of classification plugins for QGIS. You can go straight to R, which I would always recommend, and plenty of other packages. And of course, the new kid on the block, I suppose, the, the Google Earth Engine, which Stephen Carpenter will be talking about on Monday. Um, this is free and extremely powerful uh, and a great way of running some of these models for free on a cloud platform. And then the last thing to mention at this point is we've talked about model selection, about thinning out these predictive variables, but also each model needs an element of tuning as well. And it's called you know, model tuning or hyperparameter optimization. Gosh, what a mouthful. But it's all about picking the number of trees that you might use in a random forest or the distribution you use for a generalized additive model. Um, so all these it's just not a matter of running the models. There's also a matter of tuning them to get the best results out of them. Okay, well, we're moving forward quite, quite well. So we've used this software to generate our model. Okay, that now contains the rules that we can use for prediction. So it's normally a two-step process. You train the model and then use it to predict, to produce a habitat map. So, the only thing to point out, um, I think at this point, is when you're doing presence absence mapping. So if you're looking at a single species like seagrass and you're doing a presence or absence, things like random forests can give you, they can be run in kind of classifier mode and it'll provide either a presence or absence data, zero or one. You can also run it as a regression. Uh, so a random forest can be a regression model, as we've discussed. And then you'll get an output from 0 to 1. So it'll be all sorts of values from 0 to 1. And that allows you to set the threshold that you want to use to delineate what is present or what is absent. So I mentioned this because it's quite useful. So if you had coral and you had presence absence, but you only wanted to map the areas that you were, your model is absolutely sure definitely contains coral. So what you could do, is you could set that presence absence threshold at like 0.9. And so it'll only put presence polygons in areas where you are absolutely sure there's gonna be coral. Or if you wanna look at more at suitable habitat, you could take that down to 0.3 or 0.4 and, and and encode more areas as presence. So I've mentioned already that random forests perform very poorly outside the, the value ranges used for the training data. Uh, one thing that most models will do is uh, produce spatial representations of model performance. <clears throat> so these are like, rather than just single values, your model is this accurate, some of them will produce maps that will show you where it's really struggled to do the prediction. And that's really helpful because you can go back to that area and you might be able to find more ground truth in that can then help that model do a better job there. So it's, it's a spatial way of presenting map accuracy. Right, we're coming towards the end of the mapping process. Um, and as I said, Again and again, sorry to harp on about it, but you know, maps, we've got to provide some sort of assessment of quality with them as well. And there's a couple of options to do this. If we want, if, if we're using very old data and maybe the, the imagery wasn't great, a lot of cloud cover or something like that, and we wanted a process that captured all the error throughout the entire mapping process, we might choose to use an expert judgment-based approach. 
And if you're interested in these kind of holistic assessments of map quality, then Google Mesh Confidence Tool. Um, if there's a bit of time at the end, I'll come back to this. But basically, it's a process that asks you about the quality of your input data, the quality of your modeling, the quality of your identification, the quality of the scientists running it, um, any model performance statistics produced, and it merges all that into a single value. It's used a lot in the UK because it is so holistic and it can capture some of the soft sources of error that a model will not consider at all. <clears throat> um, there's the second approach, of course, is to use the performance statistics produced by the model. So all models will tell you a goodness of fit value, R squared, things like this, the amount of variance explained or deviance explained. And that is, these are collectively called model performance statistics. And they are considered to be based on seen data, i.e. they're based on the training data used in the model. They're not independent of the model, but they're very valuable measures of model performance. The third option is to use unseen data. So do you remember at the beginning, we had our training data and we split it 70% for training, but we kept a little bit aside, maybe 30% of it to actually validate our models. And now we can take that 30% and say, right, well, we've got a map. How does it compare to the initial ground truthing that we made for this map, for this whole mapping process? And then you can build um, additional accuracy values based on that comparison of what is predicted for what you actually saw in the retained section of your ground truthing data. So they basically revolve around what are called confusion matrices or error matrices. Um, and they're a standard method for analyzing the quality of habitat maps. Right, getting towards the end now, last couple of slides, I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear. Right, so overall modeling, very powerful, very useful. It combines different types of information into a unified product that um, can be extremely helpful, our habitat maps. But the old adage of garbage in, garbage out has never been more true than for habitat maps. So do your predictive variables make sense ecologically or are you adding them because you have them? Have you dealt with spatial order correlation? Have you um, chosen to um, correctly thin out your predictive variables? All these things have to be done or otherwise your models will not perform well. There are other issues about the effects of scale on accuracy. And this was one of the questions earlier about uh, georeferencing and what kind of spatial scale I need. Um, so you've got to remember that like a grab is a tiny, tiny footprint and you might be using it to ground truth um, five or 10 meter pixels. And so there is always this issue about scale and about how representative is our ground truthing of our remote sensing. That is an issue that has been um, present in habitat mapping, terrestrial and marine for decades. There's tons of literature on it. Um, it's always interesting, but you just gotta be aware of that. Think about, you know, is it acceptable, the ground truthing I'm using for the particular remote sensing I have? And to conclude, um, as I said, if you haven't got ground truthing, there are unsupervised approaches you can use. Um, supervised models are by far the more powerful and targeted way of producing habitat maps, but they do require ground truthing. And I can't emphasize enough that for me, ground truthing, um, it's the most important data set. It typically determines the quality of any map. So don't skimp on it. Um, I've also mentioned the different modeling approaches. So there are these statistical approaches, sometimes more understandable uh, and better for 
inference, and then you've got the machine learning, much better for prediction, possibly better for categorical data. Um, so plenty of choice. Um, and regardless of approach, you know, again, removing collinearity, remove, removing the spatial order correlation, and really try to be clear about the accuracy of your final products, you know, will really help people, well, the quality of your maps and people's interpretation of your maps. So I think at that point, I'll end uh, and thank you sincerely for um, sitting through a full three hours of this. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Email me if you want uh, these presentations. I'll turn them into a, PowerPoint, into a PDF and send them to you. So um, thanks again for your attention.